Welcome to The Deciding Point, our Cracked Rackets weekly roundup of the biggest storylines going on throughout the tennis world. This week, we're going to talk about the conclusion of the year's first Grand Slam, the Australian Open, officially in the books. Novak Djokovic, Naomi Osaka, our first two Grand Slam singles champions of the year, joining me to break it all down, as he always does. You know him as the forefather of the forehand slice. Our Cracked Rackets do everything. It's James Foster McDonald. Jamie, two weeks of incredible action. Action, you recovered all right? I'm doing okay. Yeah, I'm doing okay. Maybe it didn't end up the way I wanted. Uh, I had a vested interest with Medvedev to, to win the whole thing. You know, hey, it would have been great to have my pick work out, but, you know, can't get them all, so it's all good. No, I think as long as your predictions come fairly close, Jamie, you're doing the right thing. And I think all of our predictions came fairly close, given it was Djokovic Osaka emerging with the titles. And that's what we want to talk about on today's episode. We want to recap the two events, talk about the things we learned from the year's first Grand Slam, what happened that was expected, what happened that was unexpected, and so much more. With that in mind, Westoff, roll those credits, and let's get into this week's show. All right, Jamie, let's start on the women's side. Naomi Osaka emerging with a 6-4, 6-3 victory over Jennifer Brady in the final. She captures her fourth Grand Slam title of her career. It's the second time she's won the U.S. Open and Australian Open back-to-back. She did it 2018-2019. She's now done it 2020-2021. She's also 4-0 in Grand Slam finals. She fought off match points against Garbine Muguruza earlier in the tournament. Another incredible two-week run for Naomi. Naomi Osaka, your takeaways from the final and ultimately from the women's event. Yeah, look, I mean, it was a good event. Obviously, I think all of us were just glad to have it in the first place. But no, it was a good event. And Osaka was obviously one of the favorites coming into this. Uh, it's funny, I got to give props to Matt Sachs here. He said he was picking Osaka all the way. I actually was picking Muguruza, but we both agreed that whoever won that match was the favorite to move on and, and win the whole thing. And sure enough, Osaka did it. I, I'm still bitter. Muguruza, come on. You had the match points. You had the tools to do it. But look, Osaka deserves to win this title. Uh, we'll probably get into this a bit later, but for me, Osaka, great credit to you, but the the real story for me on this one is the disappointment of Ash Barty. It, it, look, she was the one seed coming into this. No, she didn't have the huge home crowds on some of these days, but I mean, she had that match against Mukova in her hands. Uh, look, she's one of the few people who can really throw off the big hitters like Osaka, like Muguruza with her um, sort of style of play, messing with the rhythm, getting the ball out of their strike zones, and she just completely flopped moving through this draw. So that's the really unfortunate one for me, and as we look ahead, I, I expect her her to be sort of angry about that and use it to fuel her throughout the rest of the season because for me you know she had a great opportunity here to at least get to the finals and then challenge Osaka who showed a few shaky moments yeah sure she won this thing and, and deserves der- deservedly so but she showed some shaky moments that I think someone like Ash Barty could have capitalized on long story short you know congrats to Osaka but there were some people like Ash Barty who really missed opportunities I think. I would echo all of those sentiments, and we break down the final in depth in the mini break recap podcast we did, so I won't get too granular here. I'll say this. It was absolutely a choppy final. It felt like Naomi Osaka was particularly beatable in that first set when she just couldn't put Jen Brady away, but, you know, ultimately for Jen Brady, too many unforced errors. She never was able to find her rhythm. So much of that credit goes to Osaka, who, you know, has entered the Serena tier as a server in the women's game. If Serena's the best to ever do it, Naomi with her serve at least this far in her career is probably 1B and I think we can all agree now when she's in form she's the best hardcore women's player in the game and I think that was something all of us had thought after the run she had in New York where she didn't lose she beats Vika Azarenka in that incredible final Uh, and then she follows it up by doing the exact same thing here to start the season off in Australia and I think that's one of my bigger takeaways is we were so uncertain how real the end the tennis at the end of last last season was, Jamie. It was the Sabalenka run through Linz and Ostrava going to mean anything what we saw her win the first event and, you know, play Serena Williams really tough here in this Australian Open and make a good run. And, you know, Elisa Mertens, we saw her make a bit of a run as well. I just think, you know, the Osaka run also, Pagula and Shelby Rogers, 
All of the people who were playing well at the end of 2020 have started 2021 strong on the women's side. And, you know, for the first time, it felt like we had continuity at a Grand Slam, right? Brady had just done it at the U.S. Open. Osaka had just done it up at the U.S. Open. Serena Williams had just done it at the U.S. Open. And then there's always one sporadic semifinalist. But that, to me, was the crazy part. It felt like this Open went to script, and that was not something I expected. Yeah, look, for the most part, it made sense, which is not something we always hear, you know, uh, <laughs> saying as the postmortem of a, of a WTA big event like this. You know, there's tons of times where you're like, you know, what just happened? Uh, but that's not really <laughs> the case here. And look, again, as we said, it, Osaka wins the title. Is anyone shocked? No. All right, Jamie, let's flip gears now, talk about the men. It wasn't the most direct path, but Novak Djokovic wins a record-extending ninth Australian Open men's singles title. He knocks off an informed Daniil Medvedev, 7-5, 6-2, 6-2 in the final, captures Grand Slam number 18 of his career. Your thoughts on his performance in the final, and ultimately, again, your takeaways from this year's men's Australian Open. Yeah, I mean, obviously, let's start at the final. Um, I mean, Djokovic returned to that form, uh, the form that's like so good, it's almost boring to watch. Um, you know, the robotic, <laughs> not making mistakes, impossible to get a ball by. I mean, that's the Novak Djokovic from, you know, prime 2015, maybe even some of that 2011 that you see that you're like, oh my God, he's so good. Um, and that's what he did. That's what he did to Neil Medvedev. Now, we can get into this more later, and we definitely talk about this on the mini break, but I, I don't think Medvedev approached this match particularly well. Don't think he necessarily made the right decision. Decisions. That being said, though, I mean, Novak Djokovic just smothered him from all points in the court. And and look, he was the best player. Like, he didn't necessarily look it with those tough matches against Tiafo and Fritz and, and some weird things happening. But it's Novak Djokovic, man. Once he gets to the finals, and he proved it. He proved why he's done this so many times. He just looked like the best player in the world. And he looked like the best to ever do it on a hard court. So he deserves to lift the trophy in the end. Yeah, my biggest question is, can anyone right now, if they play their best tennis, match Novak Djokovic's best tennis on a hard court? And to your point, I don't think we saw Daniil Medvedev's best tennis, but that's what you need to beat Djokovic three out of five on hard courts if he's not going to be hitting balls at line judges. And clearly, he's not going to be doing that anymore. And yeah, that was always the biggest fear. The numbers flashed, at, you know, every sign, the numbers, the eye test. Medvedev played better through the first six matches of this event than Novak Djokovic did, but it doesn't matter because in tennis, you still have to win that seventh match, and each match is its own entity, right? It's a completely different challenge, and just for Novak Djokovic, he presents the most challenges of any player in the history of men's tennis because you just don't know how to beat him. There is no discernible weakness, and he was in full Djokovic mode, as you mentioned, in the final. Now, again, looking broader beyond that, because as you mentioned, we'll talk about it in the mini break, uh... I think you look at the semifinalists, the quarterfinalists, the players who made runs at this event, and, you know, did anyone pencil in Aslan Karatsev in the semifinals? If you did, let's fly to Vegas tomorrow, and I'll give you all of my money to bet uh, at your disposal, but... I think you see, you know, Medvedev and Tsitsipas, two next-gen guys. They continue to firmly establish themselves. They do it at the Masters level, World Tour Finals, 500s, 250s. They're doing it at Slam. Look at all the guys who pushed Djokovic. It was Vera, it was Fritz, it was Tiago. Uh, those are all next-gen caliber players. That was a big takeaway for me. You saw FAA make a run before ultimately he lost to Karatsev, that fantastic Shapovalov sinner match from the first round. If you're a next-gen enthusiast like I am, and I like to think we are at Crack Rackets, I think this Grand Slam, while we didn't get a winner, it still was a win, right? It felt like it was a step forward. Yeah, definitely. And look, he had one in the finals in Daniil Medvedev and, and somebody who a lot of people were thinking could take it to Novak. Now, Djokovic raised his level and that is what it is. But Medvedev, very impressive here. Rublev, also impressive until he ran into Daniil. Um, <laughs> yeah. For me, though, I mean, Tsitsipas, look. This was phenomenal, and I think this was a huge win for Stefanos. Obviously, anytime you take out Nadal in a major, that's a big win, but the way he moved through this tournament fought off. I mean, look, he had that epic five-set battle early in this tournament. Um, then he moves on down two sets to love against a champion, and Nadal gets it done. Those are the sort of wins that really can, can launch you in careers and can set you up. And so I think he, he walks away from this as a huge winner, even though, you know, obviously there was a lot taken out of him and he couldn't get through Medvedev. 
Yeah, we're all back on the Berrettini bandwagon as well. And speaking of him, I just want to throw one last quick question at you. We saw a lot of injuries, particularly towards the back half of this event. And this was, you know, a a unique circumstance because of the two-week quarantine, because some players really didn't have the time to train during those two weeks if they were in the hard quarantine. You at all concerned about playing three out of five the rest of the year at these slams and the injuries that might follow? No, I don't think so, because realistically, I mean, if this is as bad as it gets numbers-wise, that's really not so bad. Uh, obviously disappointing, somebody like a Berrettini who was looking really good, others who had to pull out early Kasper on. Casper Rude. Yep, Casper Rude as well. Um, you know, look, this happens all the time. I mean, how many times have we gone through U.S. Opens where people default or, or have to retire with, you know, whether it's cramping or extreme heat or whatever. So there's always some element of that. And yeah, the three out of the five pushes players and whatnot. And um, I, I, I have been really, really happily, not surprised, um, but look, I think it's been great to see how the players have prepared. And yeah, there are some people who weren't quite ready, but overall the professionalism, even from the very, very young guys to be able to get their bodies ready for this sort of tournament was really impressive to me. So no, I I think we're good going three out of five and look, that's what makes the sport fun. Yeah, the last note would be Novak Djokovic had a lower back injury. He was nursing through days four through the end of this tournament, and he ended up as the champion. He looked just fine in the final. So yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I'm not too concerned. All right, Jamie, with all of those things in mind, we get to our deciding point here this week, and I feel like it's the topic all tennis fans have on their minds whenever a Grand Slam comes to an end, so let's address it quickly here at the end of our show. The two things we're all wondering, A, which of the big three are going to end up with the most Grand Slam men's singles titles? Federer right now has 20. Nadal right now has 20. Djokovic, with his victory, gets to number 18. Of course, the other question we're all wondering, can Serena Williams capture another Grand Slam singles title, her 24th women's singles title of her career before her career comes to an end. Where do you stand on those two questions after the year's first slam? Yeah, look, you you mentioned it. Everyone likes to ask the big questions (laughs) right after the slams. But uh, no, look, I've been saying this for years. I think Djokovic is going to end up with the most out of any of them. Um, You know, I I think even when he was back only having like 12, 13, you saw the trajectory. You saw how he was able to do this, especially because he's got two hardcore slams every year to do it. Um, That allows him to catch up big time. Um, Plus, you know, you, you take away Roger's sort of dominance at Wimbledon. Djokovic knows how to win at Wimbledon. So I I think he's just got so many chances to win. Yeah, Nadal can probably crank out a couple more Frenches, but, you know, that's one out of the four. Djokovic is probably the favorite for the other three of the year. And and so, yeah, absolutely. I think Djokovic is going to for sure end up with the most titles out of the three of them. I continue to stand by my once the dam breaks, it'll really break theory, meaning once one of these next-gen guys can just beat a Nadal, beat a Djokovic once in a Grand Slam final, I think we're going to see a couple of them do it in a rush of succession, but that moment hasn't happened yet. And if you watch the men's final, there, you know, at the end of last year, you saw Djokovic slow down a little bit. But, you know, at that point, does it really matter to him what he's chasing his Grand Slam titles and weeks at world number one? And he looked really good. You know, yeah, if you pencil him in winning Wimbledon this year, winning the U.S. Open where he is the favorites prohibitively, uh, assuming he's healthy, that's 20 right there. And then, you know, we start next season with another four. And, you know, he's he's looked so good. There have been no signs of him slowing down. I don't think I, I don't think any of them are going to get to 25. And I used to think Djokovic might actually get to 25. Now, if he does that we can stop the goat debate and that'll be you know a great moment perhaps for tennis at large but man he I mean he problem solved all week long I agree with you hard to see any you know with Federer where he's at his career yeah Rafa can win the French maybe two three more times but Djokovic looks really really good so I agree with you there on the flip side for the Serena question I mean Osaka outplayed her Like, it wasn't one of those, oh, Serena didn't play her best, and she didn't play her best, but it didn't matter because Osaka's best right now is now better than Serena's on a hard court, and that's not something we could say ever before during Serena's career, that someone's best was better than Serena's right now. I think the French Open's always a tough event for her. The one I circle is Wimbledon. 
I, this year's Wimbledon is the one. I think that's either Serena 24 or respect. And I'm not doubting her. I think she's going to keep getting to quarterfinals, semifinals, finals this year. But I think Wimbledon's the one she's got to have. Yeah, no, it's definitely possible. And look, her level of tennis is not really what concerns me at this point. I mean, you see somebody like if Jen Brady can get to the finals and Serena with her experience and what she can still do, she can get to it tennis wise. To me, what's really hurt Serena the most is sort of the, I don't know, she's lost a bit of that just untouchable legendary status because we've seen multiple people beat her in slams now. Um, That has become more common than her just pure dominance that we were so used to for a long time. And I think that is what's hurt her the most. Maybe some on the confidence side, but mostly for the opponents. It's no longer this icon that is unbeatable. It's, It's another player who you've seen multiple other people beat. And so I think that's really what's hurt her at this point. That being said, 100%. 100%. I, I do think she will get at least one more. Um, she had it. She had a chance in this in this draw. Um, yeah, you mentioned Osaka played better than her, but I mean, look, you might forget Serena got that break and had a chance to, to ride things out against Osaka and just didn't. She, she, you know, isn't maybe the front runner she is with her tennis as she used to be. Again, some of that is perhaps losing that legendary status. I'm not sure, but tennis wise, I'm not too concerned. And I was actually really impressed with her level. So, so I would say in the next couple of years, yeah, I think she'll get one. Yeah, there are just so many talented young players. Yep. Who, you know, Andrescu will find her form again. Osaka, and you also have the veterans, Halep. You've got, you know, it's the Svitolinas of the world who are right there. The Muguruza, who's clearly starting to play her best tennis again. The WTA is loaded right now. It's going to be a really, really fun decade, regardless of if Serena gets a title or not. I do, of course, hope, as I think everyone does, we are able to see her in the winner's circle one more time because that is absolutely the ending to the career that she did. Deserves. But that'll do it for this week's Deciding Point. Again, if you want to hear more about the Australian Open Finals, go check out the Mini Break podcast Jamie and I recorded where we recapped those two matches in particular. If you missed anything over the course of the two weeks, you can catch up on it all on our website, CrackedRackets.com. Shout out, as always, to Super Producer Daniel Westoff for the job he does with these episodes. But with that in mind, we hope you enjoyed all of the tennis, and we will see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.